sin que villano we can we can start you can start if you want <clears throat> thank you very much okay thank you very much so welcome once again to this, remember uh, the microphone remember the uh, microphone yes, to approach yes. sorry thanks uh i hope you're everybody is listening correctly so thank you very much for being once again with us in this artistic project webinar series 2020 so my name is uh, emiliano primo <clears throat> And today I will be speaking about uh, rheology in lithium ion battery electrode formulation. Yes. So first of all, a brief introduction. So uh, as I told you, well, my name, I am working since uh, May 2018 in the artistic project as a postdoc. Yes. Our lab is located in Amiens in France. Uh, so this is our research team uh, leaded by Professor Alejandro Franco. Is uh, Emiliano? Sorry, uh, people is saying that the volume is a bit uh, a bit low. Yeah, but uh, we already checked out. I mean, you should try no, to increase you, your you, own volume. I, I have you, the microphone next to my yes, yes. so uh, I cannot. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Okay, so uh, as I was telling you, our our lab is located in Amiens in uh, France. Uh, so. I will speak to you very briefly because uh, Professor Franco already did in his uh, introductory presentation on Monday about the artistic project. So the main deal about this project is try to uh, model uh, all the fabrication steps uh, of the lithium ion battery electrodes, starting from the slurry preparation and formulation, passing through the slurry coating and evaporation, electro calendaring, electro impregnation and cell assembly, and at the end, uh, the electrochemical performance of these uh, fabricated electrodes. So the main uh, objective of this uh, project is to develop a digital twin, which will model and will help to improve each of the stages of this uh, manufacturing procedure, okay? So here in the presentation uh, today, I will speak mainly in the two first uh, fabrication stages associated to the slurry preparation and the slurry coating. And particularly, I will uh, focus on rheology, which is a technique that I will briefly discuss uh, in a couple of slides ahead, uh, that will help us to try to understand how can we can improve our formulation by using this rheology technique. So the outline of this presentation will be a very, very basic, uh, in a nutshell, presentation of what is rheology, yes? In the second part, we will discuss how can rheology help us in the battery manufacturing which are the basic, basic uh, rheological tests we can perform during the slurry formulation. And at the end, I will give you a short case study on uh, rheology applied at the service of uh, electroformulation in battery manufacturing, okay? So first of all, let's uh, define which is, which is, what is rheology. So rheology deals with the deformation and the flow of matter, okay? The main uh, variable we will be interested in measuring uh, through rheology will be viscosity. And I will explain you in a little while what is that. So normally for performing all our rheological measurements, we use a rotational rheometer. Here I present you one of them, yes, in which its normal configuration consists about, uh, consists, consists in a plate, yes, which is uh, hold close to the base of the uh, rheometer, yes? And uh, we will place the fluid at which we want, we want to measure the rheological uh, properties in between this plate and this base, yes? So the measurement will start as soon as this plate will start to rotate around this uh, Z axis, yes? We will apply a torque and this will uh, generate a deformation and the, in the fluid that we will measure this um, deformation and with that we will calculate the viscosity, yes? So we can imagine this fluid, which is in between the plate and the base of the rheometer, as, it is, uh, as if it were organized in layers, yes? So as soon as the plate starts to rotate, yes, we, will, we, will, we can imagine these layers that start to move one on top of the other one. The layer closest to the plate, yes, will be the layer that is uh, at the highest velocity, while the layer which is closest to the base is stationary, okay? So we will have a profile of deformation of the, each of these layers of the fluid, yes, due to the force applied. So how can we understand this uh, shear flow? So as soon as the plate starts to rotate, yes, there will be a force 
that will be applied on the on these uh, on these uh, fl uh, fluid, yes, and this uh, will be the this shear stress. Okay, so this shear stress we will induce a deformation which we quanti which we can between uh, as the difference in the displacement between the top is the toppermost uh, um, layer and the, the the one closest to the base. Yes. And if we divide this uh, deformation by the uh, gap between the plate and the base, we will have the shear strain or the total deformation. So viscosity, yes, would be the ratio between this shear stress, yes, the one in here, divided by the rate of change of this shear rate. That means the derivative of the shear strain in terms of the time. So actually this viscosity, what we will tell us is the resistance of this fluid to flow. So let's go back a little bit uh, to the electron manufacturing procedure. So the first step of them all is uh, the fabrication of the slurry. Yes. So for that, what we are going to do, we will uh, mix our active material in this scheme. Actually, what I show you is the example of an NMC particle. We'll mix this uh, NMC particle powder with a conductive ar carbon additive or additives, depending on the formulation you want to do, yes. We will use uh, for giving stability to this uh, suspension of particles, a polymeric binder, which will be dissolved in a certain solvent. So this mixture is generally a physical mixture. There are some uh, people that use uh, chemical uh, bonds in order to increase the stability. But in general, we can say that we have a physical mixture of all these materials. Okay, so the stability and the interactions between all these particles, we can quantify it. We can quantify them through the viscosity, which is the resistance to the flow of all these materials, which will be suspending uh, within the liquid. So. How we will start to uh, fabricate our slurry? We will have our, all our weight powders, okay? We will add uh, the binder, the solvent, and we will start the mixing procedure. And here, what I show you are the most common slurry mixing equipment that we use for uh, formulating our slurry. Okay, so once we decide and we, we have optimized the time of mixing, the speed of mix, uh, the, the intensity of this mixing procedure, we will have our slurry, which is this body we get here. So after having our slurry, what we will do, we will want to coat this slurry on top of our current collector, yes, using uh, some kind of coating device. And then this uh, coated slurry on top of the current collector will go through an oven to evaporate the solvent and obtain our composite electrode. Here, what I present you are the most common slurry coating devices that are used both in industry normally the slot die coater and the comma gap uh, coater. And at the lab scale, of course, normally uh, what we use is a doctor blade uh, system. So how can rheology help us in the battery manufacturing? So here what I present you is uh, a profile of the viscosity in terms of the shear rate. If you remember for our previous presentations, the shear rate is again the, uh, the rate of change of the deformation in terms of time. So what we see here is a typical shear thinning behavior in which as we increase the, the uh, rate of deformation, we will see that the viscosity will, will get reduced. And this is normally the, the general profile we get when we measure the viscosity of the slurries, yes? So there are two important regions in this, um, in this profile. We have a, a low shear rates. This, the viscosity associated to low shear rates, which is this part here, is associated to the viscosity of the slurry when it, when it, when it is at rest, okay? That means that when, it is, uh, when we have our slurry after the fabrication. So it will give us an indication of the stability of this slurry, okay? And then this uh, high shear rate region will be related to the coating procedure because the shear rates associated to this part of the viscosity curve are normally the shear rates that we use uh, during the coating procedure. We have to remember that the coating procedure involves making pass this slurry through a control gap in the coating system. And this, uh, and this phenomenon uh, exerts a deformation in the slurry that will allow to flow through this uh, gap, 
and then get deposited on top of the current collector. So here what I present you are the normal uh, ranges of shear rate, but in any case, uh, you can perform your own calculation with your coating device. And I will use an example of the Dr. Blaze system. It's quite easy. What you have to do is simply to divide the rate at which this Dr. Blade is moving by the coated gap that you have set it, which is the, the distance between the uh, blade and the substrate. With that, you can have an idea of what will be the shear rate you are applying when coating your slurry on top of the current collector. So normally what we, we would prefer is to have higher viscosities at uh, low shear rates and lower viscosities at high shear rates. Yes, we need this slurry to be stable when it, when it is at rest, and we need the viscosity to decrease in order to get an homogeneous coating on top of the uh, current collector. So we need a lower viscosity, yes? So this is the most important take home message, I think, of this presentation, and the, is the fact that slurry formulation is always a compromise between the stability, which needs high viscosity, and the processability to coating, which needs low viscosity. And we will always be iterating between these two conditions. So let me present you here <clears throat> one of the basic uh, rheological tests we can perform, which is a shear rate ramp. So what we will do, we will put our slurry in, uh, on top of the base. We will fix the plate at a constant position, and we will start to rotate this plate, yes? And we will increase the speed of this rotation with that, we will increase the deformation on the slurry, and we will uh, register the viscosity in terms of this uh, rate of deformation. Here, what I present you, uh, which is quite similar to the graph we saw in our previous slide, we see the up uh, sweep, let's say, which start to deform from low shear rates, low deformations, to high shear rates, high deformations, and then we perform a sweep backward towards the initial uh, low deformation, yes. Why this uh, up and down uh, sweep in the, the for in the shear rate is important? Because the area between these two curves, the hysteresis between these two curves, is related to the thixotropy. And the thixotropy is the time-dependent shear thinning behavior. So why is important to measure this? Uh, so the thixotropy can give us information about which are the structural changes that the slurry uh, I mean, which are the structural changes of the salary as a function of the time that means uh, during a, a certain time of uh, deformation, but also due to the coating induced deformation, okay? So we have to remember that when we coat, we have the slurry at, at rest, we will exert, we will expose the slurry to a deformation due to the coating procedure, and then the slurry will get back to the its rest position when it is, when it is deposited on top of the uh, current collector. So this hysteresis will be related to this reversibility into getting back to its initial position, yes? And what we can do in our lab or uh, during the formulation of our slurry, we can uh, uh, try different formulation conditions. And then what we, we can do is to calculate these areas, yes? Uh, that we will be related to the thixotropy, yes? And we will choose for sure the formulation condition in which this area is the smallest is the smallest. So uh, let me give you a practical example of how we can uh, use this uh, viscosity for uh, understanding or improving our formulation. So uh, here what I present you is uh, a study performed at graphite-based aqueous uh, slurries using CMC as binder. And what we try to study here is the effect of the slurry solid content. So the solid content of the slurry is the ratio between the mass of solid components, that means the active material, the carbon, and the binder, and all other solid additives we add to the slurry, divided by the mass of these solid contents plus the solvent, yes? So the general idea when we are formulating a slurry is try to use as the minimum amount possible of this solvent, especially if you are working with organic solvents, uh, we want to minimize in order to not to use too much solvent, and also because when we increase too much the, the solvent content in our slurry, we will get a lower mass loadings, okay? So it's always the idea is try to reduce this amount of solvent we add when formulating our slurry. And here what we can see is that here the, the gray curve is related to a solid content equal to 42. 
and the red curve is related to a solid content equal to 44. Okay, so we reduce the amount of solvent to, let's say, intuitively try to increase its viscosity and reduce the amount of solvent used. But here, what we can see is actually that at low shear rates, we see that the, um, the viscosity actually gets reduced. And if you see the profile, you can see that actually at low shear rates, the viscosity doesn't change in, in terms of the shear rate, yes? This is what we call a zero shear rate behavior. And uh, this would mean that actually the particles that which are in suspension in this uh, formulation, in this flurry, will start to flow at rest. So this, this means that this, uh, this is not a good condition and we would not choose this condition, yes? So why, uh, why do we see that when we, increase the, um, when we decrease the amount of solvent, we actually see a decrease in the viscosity? Well, we have to remember that uh, the amount of solvent we have to add, it has to be minimized but there's always a trade-off, yes? We need certain amount of solvent in order to properly, first of all, uh, disperse of the particles, avoid aggregate formation, and also correctly dissolve the polymer. So in the condition of solid content equal to 44, we actually would see when we code that we will have a big aggregates of these solid particles, and this is translated to lower viscosity because the higher the amount of aggregates we will have in our slurry, the uh, lower the total surface area of particles exposed to the solution, which are prone to be in contact with this uh, polymer, which will give us the structure of this uh, slurry. So here we can see actually that uh, viscosity can be very helpful to understand what's going on in our slurry and to find an optimum condition. So let's go to a second time of test that we can perform uh, uh, from, the, uh, from uh, rheological measurements in order to help us to understand our formulation. And these are the small amplitude oscillatory tests in which we will probe the slurry's viscoelastic behavior. So here I will do a very, very brief uh, introduction of viscoelasticity. So normally when we deform uh, a material, we can have either an elastic deformation or a viscous one. So the materials that display both of these behaviors, depending on the, uh, let's say, the amount of deformation we exert into this material, they are called viscoelastics, yes? And this is the type of material that our slurry is. So the viscosity, uh, what we, sorry, what we will do in this kind of experiment, we will put our slurry in between the plate and the base, and we will start to apply a sinusoidal deformation, uh, yes, to the, to the slurry containing between the plate and the base, and we will uh, reg register the deformation of this slurry. So this viscosity, we can express it as a modulus divided by the frequency of this, this deformation, because actually in these experiments, instead of performing uh, 360 degrees um, deformations, what we do is around the equilibrium position, we start to deform in a sinusoidal way. So uh, this uh, will be a, a modulus divided by the frequency of deformation. And this modulus, we can express it, uh, we can express it as a real contribution and an imaginary one. So the real contribution is what we call the, is what we call the elastic or uh, storage modulus. And the imaginary component of this uh, um, complex modulus is the viscous or loss modulus. Why they are important to quantify and to get information about these modulus in terms of the slurry formulation? Well, because this elastic modulus is mainly related to reversible ish uh, deformations of this uh, of the slurry, and the uh, viscous modulus in more, is more related to irreversible deformations. Yes, and normally the type of graphs that we see is uh, graphs in which we uh, plot both the viscous and the elastic components in terms of the logarithm of the frequency. So you can see that we have, uh, for each condition we will analyze, we will have always two curves to analyze. So we have a lot of conditions. Sometimes it's a little bit tricky to understand the trends between all these uh, components. So. Another important uh, variable that we can calculate is the damping factor, which is the ratio between this viscous modulus and the elastic one. We say that when this damping factor is higher than one, 
we have a liquid like behavior. And when this damping factor is lower than one, yes, that means that the elastic modulus is bigger than the viscous one, we have a solid like behavior. So you, we can, uh, by sweeping different uh, frequencies, we can get a full spectra of these viscous and elastic components in terms of the frequency, and we will have different behaviors. Yes, these are the most common ones. The most important thing, and I will not get into too much details in this presentation, is when performing these uh, experiments, always remember uh, we have to work in a linear viscoelastic region. So if we apply a sinusoidal deformation to our slurry or to our fluid, we have to be sure, we have two parameters to control. We have the frequency of the deformation and the amplitude. So we have to make sure that the amplitude that we are applying for this deformation is within this linear viscoelastic region. And for that, what we have to do is a sweep in amplitude of the formations at constant frequency and check out in which region of, region of amplitude of the formation we see that the both the we see that the elastic component of the of the complex modulus is constant. And we will choose that uh, amplitude to perform our experiment. So let's see how all these concepts we just see apply to a, a practical example. So here, what I show you are um, small amplitude oscillatory tests for uh, NMC organic based slurries, in which the main idea here was to study the effect of the relative composition <coughs> of carbon and binder by maintaining constant the amount of active material we use for preparing our slurry and also the solid content, okay? So we can switch to this graph, which is much more easy to analyze. And here we can see that as soon as we decrease the amount of uh, carbon we add in our, in our slurry, and we uh, therefore increase the amount of PBDF or the binder we are using, we can see that we go from a solid-like behavior to a liquid-like. So in the ideal, 100% ideal case, we will always want this uh, slurry to have a more solid-like behavior and low deformation regions. Uh, that means a low frequency regions because this region will be associated with the properties of the slurry during uh, at rest. And we will hope or we will want a more liquid-like behavior at a high uh, deformation region or the high frequency region, which is the region associated more to the coating procedure. So here we can see that for the case of the uh, carbon, um, 2.5%, we see that we have a solid-like behavior in the whole frequency range. Uh, yes, we have a, a solid-like behavior in the whole, whole frequency range, and then we see that this behavior changes. So from the point of view of the formulation or from the point of view or the requirements for our electro, we know that 1.5% of carbon is too low to get a good electrochemical performance. So. Here, we would say that this condition, we will discard it and we will have to choose between carbon 2.5 and carbon 2%. If we compare uh, both of them, we can see that carbon 2.5, we have a solid light -like behavior in the whole frequency range, even at high deformation, deformation regions, yes? Uh, this would mean that when we coat this, uh, this slurry uh, on top of the current collector, we will see a lot of defects, a lot of waves, in the slurry as soon as it uh, gets deposited on top of the current collector. So we would not choose this condition. Why would, what would we choose uh, 2% and 2% regarding the fact that we can see here that at low deformations, we see a liquid like behavior. So um, first of all, we have to also use these uh, measurements with the normal shear, the normal viscosity versus shear rate uh, profiles. And here, what we can see is that because the fact that we have a liquid-like behavior, yes, at uh, low deformations, the viscosity associated to these uh, low deformation regions is quite high to ensure us that this instability due to viscous deformations of the slurries at rest will take a long time uh, that will ensure us that the, the, the slurry will be stable between the finishing of the slurry mixing and the coating procedure. In any case, if for the formulation procedure or for the electrode uh, characteristic, characteristics we are looking, we need high carbon content, that means that we have to stick to this formulation, 2.5, 1.5. What here, what we could try in order to uh, increase a little bit uh, this uh, ratio and make it more liquid-like at high deformation is to increase a little bit the solid content. 
In this case, we will <clears throat> favor that at high um, at high deformation rates, we will get a more liquid like behavior. Okay, so let's uh, try to use, or let's, uh, I will show you right now uh, an example of how rheology helped us to interpret or to understand the results coming out from uh, studying the effect of slurry formulation and coating processes parameters into uh, actual, actual uh, electro properties. So here, this paper was presented already by Theo yesterday. So I will not get into too much details in terms of uh, the artificial intelligence, the machine learning algorithms we use for developing all the graphs that I will present you. I will just try to sketch out the general methodology of this paper. So here, the idea in this paper, we, what we did is to change for formulation parameters such as the um, the relative amount in t in between active material and the carbon and binder, the solid content of this binder, and the uh, coating gap we use to deposit this uh, slurry on top of the uh, current collector. So for all these uh, different conditions, we applied always the same drying process because in this case, we were not interested in studying the effect of drying. And then what we did is at the final composite electro, we measured both the mass loading and the uh, porosity of these electrodes. So then what we did is to uh, generate a database in which we relate all these uh, slurry formulation and coating process variables to the final electrode uh, properties. And what we use is we use support vector machine algorithm in order to uh, classify this data and help us to predict how can we control these uh, electro properties in terms of the slurry formulation parameters? So here, what I present you uh, at the right of the slide is the results for the porosity yes, of the electrode. Uh, that uh, for classifying the porosity, we use three classification levels, high, which is uh, light blue, medium, which is pink, and low, which is uh, white. In terms of the active material content of the slurries, the solid content we use for preparing these uh, slurries and the viscosity, which is related to the coating uh, procedure. And here, the, the most important thing that we can see from these results is that as we increase the amount of active material uh, in, this, um, in the prepared slurries, we can see that here in this right uppermost, pa uppermost part, we go from a, a region in which we have uh, medium porosities and as we increase the amount of active material, we start to see that there is a higher reach, a higher contribution of the low porosity uh, electrodes. So the question that we ask ourselves when we saw this result is, this is physically relevant because actually these results come from the fitting of a machine learning algorithm. So physically, this is real. Can we understand this? So the rheology give us the exact answer about uh, the results that, we just, that I just presented. So here, what I show you are the, um, the um, small oscillatory tests performed on the slurries. Here, what I will show you are these uh, extreme cases of low active material content and high active material content of the slurries at two different solid contents, okay? So here, let's focus first in the low active material content slurry. We can see that for the whole frequency range, the damping factor is lower than one. That means that we have a solid-like behavior. And we can see also that this solid-like behavior is not so sensitive when we change the solid content of these slurries. If we compare with the uh, rheological properties of a slurry which has high contents of NMC, we will see that it is fairly enough, if it is fairly true to say that from the whole frequency range, we have a, a predominant liquid-like behavior because we can see that the damping factor is higher than one for the, or the whole frequency range. And we can also see that as we increase the solid content, we see an increase in this liquid-like behavior. So what's going on? How, how this can explain us why we saw the, the trends we saw in our previous uh, results? For the case of the, the slurry that it behaves as a solid, yes, we can imagine uh, this because uh, due to the interactions between all these solid particles and the high amount of wind that we have 
in the slurry, yes, we will we will we, we can say that we have a very strong binding network that we will hold all these particles together. Yes, and this uh, high amount of uh, polymer will ensure that this uh, connection will have a high uh, elastic component and therefore a high uh, solid-like behavior. So we have to remember that when we uh, deform when we coat the electro with the slurry, sorry, on top of the current collector, we perform a deformation. So if this deformation is uh, mainly elastical, elastic, that means that as soon as this slurry is coated on top of the current collector, the structure will regain its initial condition or its initial configuration, and we will get uh, less dense uh, electrodes, which will be translated in um, high porosity or medium porosity electrodes. So why for 96, we see mainly low porosity. So in this case, we can see that uh, as, it is, as it has mainly a liquid-like behavior, as we produce the deformation due to the coating procedure, we will, uh, this deformation will be mainly irreversible, which will mean that we will reduce the density of this, uh, sorry, increase the density of this, um, of this, of the, the arrangement of the particles, and we will get particles more closer each one to the, to, to the other ones, meaning that we will attain uh, lower porosity electrodes. And also you can see that if we compare the behavior of the uh, high active material content slurry and the, sorry, low active material content and high active material content, we can see that actually in this condition, it's more sensitive to the solid content, yes? And this is due to the fact, sorry, oh, sorry, uh, I come back. So, and this is due to the fact that actually this liquid-like behavior, yes, changes uh, much more in terms of the solid content for the high NMC content slurry as opposed to the low NMC content, okay? So clearly we can see that uh, rheology gave us a tool to explain from a physical point of view uh, all the results we get coming out from the machine learning um, results. So this is just for finishing and to give you like a bonus. Um, as I already told you, this viscosity, which is the resistance to flow, will be related to uh, these interactions that get uh, that are that take place between the particles in suspension in the uh, slurry. So uh, we use actually these viscosity curves, which are related to the interactions between the particles, to uh, validate uh, um, a model that. Uh, help us to modulate this uh, slurry state using coarse grain MD uh, molecular dynamics, okay? So we can also use uh, these viscosity curves to get uh, physical information coming out of the interactions between all these particles. So for finishing, I, will, I hope I showed you that uh, rheology can help us to understand and to improve electro formulation. Uh, because it gives us information about the interactions between the slurry components, which, deter which determine the electrode microstructure and will impact in the following steps on the battery manufacture. But we have always to remember that the information and insights coming from rheology should always be coupled with the electrode requirement. That means that we cannot go to a condition in which we will have a very high, uh, let's say, viscosity, a low deformation, and very low viscosity, a very high deformations, because maybe this condition is related to a formulation in which, I don't know, we have almost nothing about of carbon. So we have to remember that rheology has to be uh, coupled with the electro requirement and the final electrochemical performance. So for finishing, I would like to uh, thank uh, our research team, uh, our lab, uh, LRCS, our funding coming from ERC, and a special thanks to the master student, which uh, has which, which has been uh, working with us since February and, uh, and is working on electro formulation of graphite based uh, slurries. So I'm now open for questions. Thank you very much, Emiliano, for a very nice presentation. I think you can go to the question menu and uh, pick the questions. I, I just would like to, to ask some reminder for all of the people uh, in the audience. So please use the question section to ask questions for the speakers. Do not uh, do it on the chat because uh, it allows people and speakers to show the, the question directly on the presentation. Also, a quick reminder for the registration. If you are still not registered for the other sessions of the webinar series, please use the link 
on the top of the chat and select the session you want to, to intend. Also, a last thing about the presentation, because I received so many questions about the slides. So the slides are not available for everyone, but the presentation through a video will be available as soon as possible on the artistic website in the press session. Thank you. Mark for the precisions. So Emiliano, you can go ahead. So here I have the first question, question which says... A approach your micro, Emiliano, yes. please. Yeah. Why the damping factor increases initially, then decreases in the figure of damping factor versus uh, frequency? How? So this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is due to the fact normally that uh, as soon as we start to deform our slurry, we will see that uh, at certain distances, we will see that we will favor the liquid-like behavior, the deformation in a more viscous way. But as soon as the deformation is uh, quite uh, high, yes, we will uh, uh, favor uh, mostly the uh, solid like or the elastic like uh, behavior. So this is related to the, the, the strength of these deformations. This is quite normal in these kind of systems. Um, I don't know. I mean, actually, uh, what we could do in order to check out is to perform a whole uh, experiment in which we change the frequency from smaller values up to higher values, and we will see a whole spectra of them. But this is quite normal. This is uh, quite normal for, at least for all the slurries that I have studied with, this is quite normal, this kind of, uh, this kind of response. Okay. So, the next one. The southern ratio is the same for all the slurries, depending on which material is defined. Okay. So, yes, for this case, uh, the only thing we changed in this study is only the uh, solid uh, content, for this case in particular, okay? So, uh, we maintain constant the amount of uh, active material, carbon binder, and we only change the amount of solid we add to perform our uh, slurry. Um, depending on which material uh, is Design well, uh, as I told you, is defined in terms of uh, the whole mass of the solvent. I hope I got your uh, your question. If not, you can uh, ask it again. I'm sorry. So, next one. In your presentation, you discussed both organic-based and water-based slurries. Could you please comment on the difference in terms of rheological properties we can expect be between these two cases? Okay, nice question, uh, Nora. Uh, so actually, uh, from my experience, what I always see that is that uh, normally when we work with organic-based uh, slurries with uh, NMP as solvent, we normally work with slurries that are higher in terms of uh, the viscosities we measure. Um, and uh, usually it's quite easy, and this is a clear example, in, uh, in organic-based uh, slurries to get a... Um, um, behavior in which the viscosity always increases as we reduce the shear rate, which is really good in terms of stability. In the case of water-based slurries, uh, normally uh, you have to work with higher uh, amount of, uh, of uh, the solvent. And also, it's quite tricky to remove this uh, zero shade, shear rate behavior. You have to work a little bit with adding some kind of dispersant in order to favor the dispersion of these solid particles in the solvent. Okay, next question. Did you also study the impact of shear rate in formulating and processing of slurries on the final performances of the electrode material? Okay, so yes, this is actually the work we are doing with our master student. We are trying to directly link uh, the formulation parameters to the electrochemical response of the electrodes in terms of the polarization of the electrodes, in terms of how good this electrode can be calendared or not and in terms of uh, the specific capacity. So this is a uh, work that is uh, going on, actually. Okay, please, Alejandro, tell me when it's ready in terms of time. I'm not following. We have uh, ah. eight minutes, ah, eight okay. minutes. Okay, so can you use uh, computer simulations to study fixotropy in your system? Uh, that is a really good question. I'm not quite sure. I'm not an expert in modeling, but uh, Maybe I can answer you in, uh, in some other way. 
normally tixotropy, the tixotropy of the material is related to the time dependent uh, behavior. So for sure you will have to work in some kind of a simulation in which you can uh, monitor time of, uh, of, the, of the deformation. But uh, I'm not <clears throat> quite sure, I'm not a modeling, a modeling expert, so I'm not quite sure uh, which kind of uh, simulation you can actually use for this. So next question, when you mentioned <clears throat> interaction, did you work on the combined eff effect of uh, composition, composition, e.g. carbon and lithium? Um, I'm not quite sure uh, what does the question mean, but uh, while we, when when I speak about interaction, I mean we have to remember again that the this slurry, the, the slurry is a suspension of solid particles, which are embedded in a polymer matrix, which is uh, dilute, uh, which is dissolved in a solvent. Okay, so if we would aim to disperse these particles only with a solvent, we will get an instant precipitation because for sure uh, they are the, the particles that we normally use, especially for the active materials are quite big. So we need this uh, polymer in order to interact in some way with the surface of the particles and generate a network that will give stability to the dispersion. So this is what I talk about uh, when I talk uh, about interaction. I'm not sure if I, answer your question, you can ask it again, maybe. So, is the other battery electrodes have similar data trend in terms of rheology? I'm guessing you are speaking about the last results that I presented. And yes, I mean, actually what I present here just in for, for the sake of clarity, because there, there is already too much information with all these two graphs, is to present the both extreme cases. But the change is more gradual if you start to analyze between 92.7% and 94%. So for sure it's a gradual change. So that's why I, I chose the, the extreme condition. Okay, next question. I think slide nine, you compare three formulations. Why do you think there is such a large difference between 2.5 and 2% carbon content, but then a relatively small change between two and 1.5 percent. Uh, here it is. Uh, so, I mean, what we what we need uh, to understand here is that carbon. Uh, this is something that is coming out from my experience. Carbon, as it is, uh, the, the carbon aggregates normally in this case, I think that I use uh, C65 carbon. Yes, has a huge. Uh, uh, are surface area, yes, uh, per gram of material. So that means that when you start to increase up to a certain point, yes, the, the amount of uh, the carbon that you add to your slurry, you see a very huge increase in the viscosity due to this uh, higher contribution in the area exposed to the solution, which again is related to the amount of interactions that this polymer can have uh, with the solid particles. So that's why we see this, uh, this change. And also we have to remember that here, what I might say constant is the uh, amount of uh, solvent. For sure, for the condition in which you have a lot of carbon, in order uh, to optimize the formulation, you will need much more solvent in order to properly disperse the, all these uh, carbon particles. So if we play a little bit with uh, the solid content of this study, for sure we will see that this behavior will start to approach a little bit more to the upper part of the damping factor graph. Next question. Uh, any comments on drying temperature and duration impact on coatings? Also impact of aging of electrodes until cell assembly takes place. Okay, very nice question. So actually uh, this is a project ongoing also in our research team, the impact of drying temperatures. Normally what you can find in bibliography tells us that uh, you need to uh, dry uh, not very fast the electrodes in order to get a proper evaporation of the solvent and do not get any kind of aggregation of carbon particles. But in any case, this is something that we are trying to study both from the experimental point of view and from simulations. And uh, the agent of electrodes until cell assembly, yes, uh, that's completely true. Uh, normally what we do is uh, in order to avoid any kind of problems of uh, oxidation or the aging of the materials and all that, what we do is normally we store our electrodes in a dry room 
in order to avoid uh, contact with water, especially, especially with these non-coated NMC active materials. Could you please co comment how the carbon particle size and NMC particle size will influence the slurry behavior? The conductive carbon is nano size particle, it's prone to agglomerate during slurry preparation. How do we avoid that agglomeration? Okay, very nice question. Uh, so we have to remember that if we speak at constant, let's say we, we are comparing two slurries at constant mass of uh, the solid components, and the only thing we change is the particle size distribution. What I would expect is that as you reduce the particle size distribution, yes, you will have more surface exposed to the solution. So if we are working with the same amount of, we, we should tune a little bit the amount of polymer in order to establish a good, uh, let's say, contention network for all these particles if you decrease too much the particle size. Uh, how, do you ca how can you avoid the agglomeration? Well, that depends a lot also in the mixing system you're using. Uh, what I can suggest uh, in general, general speaking is to try to start the first stages of uh, the mixing uh, at, uh, low solid at low solid content and then add uh, uh, enough uh, solvent in order to get your desired solid, co solid uh, content. This is the best way to avoid all these kind of agglomerations. Hello, Emiliano, yes. it's time. Okay. okay. Thank, thank, you, you, thank, thank you very, very much. much to everybody to, for the question, and I will try to answer it uh, right now uh, through the chat. Thank yes, you very please. much. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk. It's, it's normal, Emiliano. Thank you very much for your nice thank presentation you. and great work. So for everybody, so you see, the, Emiliano's presentation illustrates one of the strengths of the artistic project. So in the artistic project, we are working on modeling, but it's modeling is ex strongly connected to experimental characterizations, right? At different stage of the manufacturing process. Well, Emiliano show you today the, the case of the slurries, but for sure we are also working, as Emiliano mentioned, the solvent evaporation, the calendaring, and for sure the electrochemistry as well. So this is really a strain of the project. So it's modeling connect to experiments. Okay. okay. Uh,